that will change and touch our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you will make us better on the work you have given us to do. Amen. And that the things that may seem confusing or embarrassing to us, you clear up everything for us, all through this time of the workers' retreat in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord, that we will be prepared for greater service this very year. Amen. And we pray, Lord, that all the weaknesses and the shortcomings and the problems and the defeats of the past will not continue to plague our lives. Amen. But there will be a definite change so that we'll be able to do your work Amen. in a proper way in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's wonderful that we can be together at this workers' retreat. At the latter part of last year, I took the districts in Lagos City here and we divided the workers' retreats to the various districts depending upon their peculiar problems. And that is why we have delayed your own workers' retreat until this time so that we can address the issues concerning your own particular area of the work in a special way. And it's uh, particularly important for us that we understand that the work we're doing is very, very similar to the work of um, the Bible days. And in particular that you are here now, it's good that we're able to consider your circumstances and the work that God has given you to do as we consider the references of the Bible that are particularly relevant to what you are doing. Now you must understand that the city situations that we have today are something very, is something very, very recent. That is in Bible days. The Bible days is just um, the days devoted to rural people. There were many rural people at the time of the Bible than at the time we have now. Because in those days, cities were not very common. The things that were common were villages and small, small towns. Industry was not something very common at that time. Technology was not something very common. Colleges, universities, and governmental places that we have now the big, big structures and infrastructures were not very common. If you remember the children of Israel, they were farmers, and the women were housewives, and there were markets. And if you have read about the history of the children of Israel, and even of the Roman people, their markets were the same with their towns. And much was devoted to the markets of those days. Most of the people were also illiterates. And so they had to deal with a lot of superstition, a lot of idolatry. If you have read, even in the so-called cities of those days, like Ephesus, like Corinth, you'll discover that their situation was very, very similar to what you find today. And the level of hygiene was very, very poor in those days. And if you also look at the literacy or illiteracy of the people, there's something significant you'll discover. That the people that they had to preach to, those apostles and those preachers of the day, most of them were illiterates. Many of them could not even read. In fact, apart from the fact that the general population of the people could not read, even the apostles themselves, what surprised the people on the day of Pentecost is that, how is it that we're hearing these people that they speak another language? In the language in which we were born, knowing that these were Galileans, that will tell you something, that the only, most of the people knew just one language, their mother tongue. They didn't know the Greek, which is now equivalent to our English. Neither did they know the Hebrew, which is equivalent to the normal language that everybody can communicate in. And when they got these people before the council, the council were the elite of the people, the small group of people that were educated. So they got these people. They were very sure these people that were propagating this new religion, they won't know anything. So they called them, they started challenging and questioning them. They were surprised that they talked intelligently. They felt they should be unintelligent people. And they said, ah, ah. then they took knowledge of them. They had been with Jesus Christ. 
Now, when it says they had been with Jesus Christ, understand what they were saying. That in the same way, Jesus didn't go to school. How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? He also manifested wisdom that bothered them and baffled them. So when they saw that these people were talking in intelligently and they were not educated, well, they said, well, no wonder. The Jesus they are proclaiming, he too did not go to our seminary and to our colleges and to the universities, and yet he was talking sense. The same thing with these people. The point I'm making to you is that sometimes you have felt that you are strange in, the, in preaching the word of God. That your locality is very, very strange, but your locality is just like in Bible days. You are the people that are nearest to the Bible, nearest to the New Testament. Do you remember in the Acts of the Apostles that when they went to Ephesus and Paul the Apostle and the other people started preaching and the people disagreed, they cried for two hours without stopping. Great is the goddess of Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians, which shows you that the people were idol worshippers. Now what I'm telling you is that whenever you meet the work of God, you feel we are on strange land. The idolatry is too much. The opposition is too much. The persecution is too much. And as you grapple with the problems and struggle with the problems that you have, how are you going to get land? How are you going to build churches? Now you must remember when you read in the Hebrews, it says how you suffered the destruction of all your property. And it appears that even you people, you are not worthy to live on the face of the earth. Nobody will give them land. Nobody will give them any facilities at all. And then you'll remember that as you read the Acts of the Apostles, you'll see that Paul the Apostle gathered with the people in the school of one Tyrannus, which shows us then, you see, we meet in a particular school building. We meet in another place. If we were in a city, well, the cities are far away from the Bible. We're just trying to bring them to understand the denial, the self-denial, the sacrifice that it takes in the Bible, real Bible teaching. But coming to you and coming to your own district is very easy preaching to you because all that we're saying from the Bible just fits into your very location. But then that poses a challenge to you. It makes you to understand that if you have been thinking they are growing in the city, all because of the amenities in the city. Then you understand in the Bible days, they didn't have all those amenities and yet the church grew. Then you must be asking yourself, now you are ministering in the same circumstances as the people of old ministered. Therefore, if you are not growing, there is a problem with you, not with God, not with the Bible. You have been saying the opposition of the other religion is so strong. That's why we cannot grow. You must understand that today Islam is very, very mild. When you think about the Jewish religion of that time, do you know that in the Jewish religion of that time, they arch, they said, they told Pilate, we have a law, by our law, he ought to die. And there was no appeal to any other, to any other body or to any other higher court of appeal. By the law of this religion, this fellow ought to die. Do you remember in the Acts of the Apostles that when, he took, uh, when Paul took Titus and the other people, they went to the synagogue. They said, help men. These people, being Greeks, they have come to defile the temple. And immediately, they started binding Paul the Apostle with uh, barbed wire, with rope that has tongues. But uh, he happened to have been a Roman as well as a Jew. And he said, do you scotch a man that is a Roman without even trying him? Which means that they didn't even try him, whether he was guilty or not guilty. They started punishing him. Now, you cannot even do that today in many of the villages because of civilization. Things were bad at that time. So, if you have been thinking things are bad, we can preach, relax. Let's come back to the Bible. We are just like in Bible days once again. And look at how many you are today. Jesus had just 12 people to start with. And out of those 12, one was a rotten egg. And yet, he wanted to build an everlasting kingdom on those people. Look at how many you are. And look at all these uh, women that are here today. And some of our pastors will say, we don't have people. You know the type of people Jesus are? The people that followed him. It says in Luke chapter 8, the women 
or from whom he had cast out evil spirits. And he started naming them one by one. This one, seven spirits went out of her. Well, you have better people to work with today. And you need to understand that we praise the Lord that we are more than 12. I guess we are more than 70. Without counting, those of you look back. You don't know how many there are at the back. Look back and see the people behind you. Don't you think there are more than 70? Do you remember after Jesus had gone away to heaven and he said, Wait. And he committed to them that they will evangelize Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the earth. Do you remember how many there were? Just 120 that gathered at the upper room. And I think we are more than 120 here. And the 120 people, a lot of them were unemployed. A lot of them, they had left their job, and there was nothing else for them anymore. A lot of them were just fishermen. Do you remember the stories that Jesus told them? The stories that will show you, when you are talking to an audience, the type of stories you tell will show you what type of audience you have. He so I went forth to sow. He must have been talking to farmers. And the kingdom of God is like a man throwing a net into the sea. He must have been talking to just rural village people that had, uh, you know, fishermen among them. I, was, I will tell you something. You people, you are like little children playing on the street. And we'll say we are piped to you and you didn't dance. He wasn't talking about Lagos City. You know, the Lagos City people, they don't know what it means. Uh, you know, taking the bucket and beating it and saying, you didn't dance well. You didn't dance well. You must have been talking about a village. You get the point I'm making? So you are just now in Bible days. And what I'm talking to you tonight about is in times like this, God... That is, in the situation in which you are, we need to examine the Bible and see the situations in which we are. And in times like this, in the times like where you are now, what you may be going through, what it may appear that you are suffering, in times like this, God. Now, I want to first of all describe the times that we're talking about, the things that happen to other people, that we may discover those things are happening to us today. And then their solution to the problem that they had at that time, the solution was God. And in the situations we have today, the same solution do we still have in the problems we have today. And the solution is still God. But first of all, let me show you the circumstances of different people in those days. And then you try to find out whether you have the same circumstances or not. I'll go through a lot of references, so we need to be fast as we open our Bibles, and then we see through. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Very, very similar to God's saying that I have seen the affliction of my people at Ekorodu, at Ijede, I've seen the affliction of my people, the joblessness, joblessness, and the, the affliction, the hunger, the sorrow, the suffering, the jeering of the people, the reproaches of the people. I've seen the affliction of my people. And so you understand that even people in Bible days, they also had times when they had sorrow, when they had affliction. In Numbers chapter 20, and in verse 2. And there was no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. You know, sometimes we feel that because we do not have basic needs, how can we serve the Lord? These people did not have the basic need of water. And in our villages and localities where we have come from, Sometimes we have to go a long way to go and draw water. And sometimes you think that is strange. And sometimes even believers, Christians, will grumble and complain about this type of situation where you don't even have pipe water. Or where it appears the well water that you have is so polluted. How are we sure this thing is hygienic? The people too at that time, they didn't have water. The basic necessities of life. And sometimes, you know, it's like that. And yet, in times like that, when it appears that basic necessities are not available, 
That's the time we ought to remember that God is still there. Numbers 21, verse 4. And he journeyed from the Mount Ur by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. I think a problem you have to res wrestle with in the various districts and zones and villages is the fact that some of the people that were not originally part or citizens of that village, they say they are going back home. You say, no, let us stay. You are the only people we depend upon in this fellowship, in our church here. Now, if you go now, and so-and-so also goes back to his uh, state, so-and-so also goes back, and the people that are running back, they want to come back to Lagos City because, you see, there is no work. I can't feed my family. And even the house we're living with, uh, we're living in, the thing is uh, leaking, and the landlord will not come and repair it. And during these, uh, you know, times of these uh, festivals of the uh, idol worshippers, uh, women can come out at other times, strangers can come out at a particular time in the night. This one can't happen. Now, you are discouraged. And because of the discouragement, you feel that the only thing for you to do is just to go back to the major city. Why don't you pray about it? Don't you remember? In times like that, remember God. Because all these situations are not strange to God at all. Then it comes to the time of retrenchment, unemployment, and famine. Let's remember that in Ruth chapter 1, the same situation was uh, the thing that this family experienced. And instead of sailing through and looking up to the Lord in that unemployment situation and retrenchment situation, they decided they will have to move away from where they were. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramah saying, Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. Sorry, uh, I'm reading from Ruth chapter 1 verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. This, sometimes the church begins to dwindle. And the reason the church is dwindling is because people are moving away. There's a lot of the farming situation. They do not have enough thing to sustain themselves in your locality where you are. And therefore you are saying, well, we're just winning the converts for the major towns. Because immediately they come to the Lord because of the biting situation and the biting circumstances of the people. They just move away. And it appears that we're not working enough. We're not preaching enough. We're not doing the work enough. Because the families are just moving away. And we have to be encouraging them. Do not move away. Do not move away. But it even becomes a heightened problem. When the pastor himself, because he's not fully paid, it's not a person that has um, uh, is drawing salary from the church, and he himself, the work he's doing there is dwindling. And he says, what will I do now? And when the pastor himself is considering moving away from that village or moving away from that location because of unemployment, then you know that the problem is becoming very serious. But again, we must learn from the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he leave behind with the apostles before he left? He was discussing with them. In the closing chapters of Luke. And um, he was asking them, when I sent you out two by two with nothing, did you lack anything? They said they didn't lack anything. So he was, from that you can tell, he was leaving them behind without money. Because the person that was carrying the bag, he was a person not accountable. He loved money so much. By the time Jesus left, nothing remained in that bag. Nobody even had him to be able to uh, tell him, make an account of the bag that you have been carrying. Because he had gone to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody was scattered. They didn't remember to ask Judas Iscariot, how about the money that remained? Give an account. Now the end of the year has come, or the end of the ministry is coming on. Give an account and let us know what you spent on charity. What you spent on buying bread. 200 penny loaf of bread will not suffice for this multitude. What you spent in buying the fish. 
what you spent in paying the tax and paying the rent. Nobody saw him to make any account. He's gone with the bag and with everything. And so Jesus said, when I sent you out and there was nothing, did you lack anything? He said, they said they lacked nothing. Then he told them, whatever you have, have now, take it along with you. And they replied and they said, Lord, all we can see here, there are two swords. That's to cut the road when they were going on their evangelism. That's what I told you. That he told them now, as you are going, and as I send you out, if you have anything, take it along. Oh, they said, all that we have here, we have two swords and 11 people. Well, he said, that's enough. That will cut the road while you are going on. Although they thought it was to fight, that's why Peter drew that sword and he cut off the ear. Are you getting the point I'm making? But then eventually they had nothing. But then on the day of Pentecost, they just gathered together. Think about all the 120 in just an apartment in the upper room, not in a building like this. So if they had this, that would be great for them. They didn't have all this. Just the Holy Ghost came upon them. That's how the work started. And that's why they were going to the temple. That's borrowing the temple to use. Just at the courtyard of the temple. And they'll preach to the people. So the conditions we have today in the suburb, in the villages, in the localities where you are, very similar to Bible times. And at this time, because of the unemployment, this family, they wanted to move away. In fact, they actually moved away. And if you're having situations like that, let us remember that in such a situation, the Lord can care for his son. And I believe he will cater for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes there is sickness. And the sickness is so terrible that you feel, how is it? I'm not getting healed. But remember that when Ezekiel was sick, Isaiah came to him. Isaiah did not come with a great promise of the Lord, saying, According to the word of the Lord, I will not put any of these diseases of Egypt upon you, which are brought upon them. But if you will keep my word, he just said, make up your house, put everything in order, thou shalt die. And sometimes there are believers that have sicknesses, and it appears that they are terminal sicknesses. And you feel, why am I like this? And you feel it never happened in Bible days. But let me remind you again, in times like that, when there is a sickness that looks terminal, incurable, or chronic, and has been there for a long time, remember the case of Hezekiah, and remember that God can still handle that situation. But then we are told of Jehoshaphat, that's another time now, there was a battle. And you know that sometimes there are battles in the village. Because one, the idol worshippers are having a battle against you. Or it may be that the police stationed there, they are all composed of Muslims. And therefore, any case that comes concerning having a Bible study there, having a location there, having something preaching the gospel there, before they even listen to you, the pastor, they are negative from the onset. Because you know that that police station is all made up of people of Islamic religion. Now, what are you going to do in such a situation? Well, that's a battle for the Lord. When Jehoshaphat faced that battle, fear came up in his heart. And because of that, he needed to pray and fast. Let me tell you this. If people in the city, if they only fast once a year, maybe because they don't understand the forces of evil, but I can't imagine a person ministering in the village who can only be fasting once in a year. Who doesn't understand that fasting and praying is a ministry? And that it is a ministry that you need in the battles of life. That you understand that when all roads are blocked, when all possibilities look far away, when the battle is greater than your strength, and when you are facing the type of things that they faced in the time of Jehoshaphat, you'll need to proclaim a fast. And I think if we believers in Lagos, once in a while, think about praying and fasting, I think that those in the villages, they need to understand that praying and fasting should be greater. Because the battle that came against, against Jehoshaphat is even a simple battle. When you think about the battles that come in the villages, because in the villages, the secret societies are very raw. The secret societies in the town, sometimes they're a little bit civilized. You know, they talk in English. And they do not, they have, you know, a particular building in the town where they have their shrine. 
in the village you don't have anything like that sometimes what they will use when they want to be very strong in their evil power is that they have a shrine in the forest behind the uh, the village and in that forest where they go to make all their sacrifices and do all their things and everybody knows that that place is a sacred place do you have that in the village okay and um, the people sometimes if somebody who is a stranger and who is not a believer if he goes astray and he doesn't know what that place is and he passes through that place even he can have the feeling of an evil power predominant in that place without anybody there without any charm being done against him are you, you are following what i'm saying now people that are ministering in such a community that right at the backyard of that village there is this forest that nobody must cut the tree nobody must touch anything around that place and even a stranger who is not a believer if he passes through that place he will sense the evil a person like that goes throughout the year without praying and fasting i don't know i will be successful that's why we understand that in the battles that you may face in your communities where you are this kind goeth not out but by praying and fasting at other times i know that believers face situations that are very confusing some things happen in the fellowship that you do not have an explanation for and when it happens to you like that when you are confused when we are confused we do not remember that the answer is to pray just go before the lord even if it is to say to the lord oh lord there is confusion in my mind i don't know what to do i don't know what direction to go when you are confused remember in times like this god in job chapter 10 verse 15 if i be wicked woe unto me and if i be righteous yet will i not lift up my head i am full of confusion therefore see thou mine affliction this man confessed here i am full of affliction there are times that things happen in our lives or in the life of the church in which we are and we're just perplexed we're just confused we do not have a solution we do not have an answer and sometimes as a pastor in the village you do not know what you are going to give as an answer somebody for example might say in the village church that he went out witnessing as he went out witnessing he came back after witnessing and the person he was witnessing to told him or told her don't talk about jesus don't talk about christ to me because i'm an idol worshiper and the fellow said he kept on witnessing and kept on talking and then the fellow went into the house and this christian not understanding there are different levels of authority and power he stood there and he said i'm a christian and the fellow came out with the horn of an animal with something inside there and started saying something like an incantation and he stood there after the thing finished the christian fellow felt dizzy felt almost that he will fall down and began to say jesus jesus then he recollected himself and then went to the house all through that night he could not sleep and then he came to you as a pastor and he said i don't understand this i'm a child of god I, you told us to go into all the world and pray the gospel to every creature i started preaching to that person he went to the house and i felt that greater is he that is me than he that is in the world that jesus sent me to come and talk to this fellow so nothing will happen to me i felt nothing will happen to me but look at me while the person was talking i was feeling dizzy i even had to call jesus many times so that i wouldn't fall down how do you understand that we are confused the pastor is confused the person asking the question is confused and then he goes in the night he cannot sleep and we have to choose people and we pray overnight praying and praying and praying for the person eventually the person now gets well but then he says i don't think i will witness again because i've lived in lagos before in lagos we stand in the bus and we preach and we witness nothing happens if anybody comes down maybe he's a jehovah's witness or a religious fellow if he argues we argue with him at night i sleep but look at me in this village now i just came and i don't know what's happening to me that's confusion but you in times like that god when you have done what you think you ought to have done and what happened brought confusion and brought fear within you 
then we should remember that even though we are confused and we do not have an answer, yet God is there. And sometimes, as I said before, the persecution is very high in the village setting. Because, you see, in the village setting, is the federal government and there is the law that normally will operate in the cities, in the towns, in the high court. Then there are the normal towns where you have amenities and you have normal things. And then there are laws that are they're reaching down, and we can argue about that in the court. Do you know that in the village, there are laws that are not written down? And there are superstitions that are as strong as the law, even stronger than the law of the federal government. That if, for example, you were, the, you were going in front of a mosque, in a predominantly Muslim village and you shouted the name of Christ and the people came out and they beat you almost to death that if you went to the uh, court there I don't mean the real court now but the village um, you know square now when you get there the chief the over there will tell you that though you are almost beaten to death you have to apologize to the people that are offended because you offended. Whereas in the town, that will be different. Are you getting what I'm saying? There are places in the community that a church must never be built. Now, because it's in the town where we have the town planning. But the ones where you must never build a church is by the local decision over there by the people that in our community here, a foreign religion has never had land in this part of the town. And if you are looking at that place and you say, I'm a Christian and you are talking English, and then you say, well, well, look at it, that's where we're going to get. If it is on grammar and law, you'll never make it. If it's by praying and fasting, you can make it. Therefore, you know that there are some superstitions and laws in the villages that if you just go into those villages and you don't know all those things, that those things are there, you'll just be facing a lot of persecution and you will be pushing against a block wall that you'll not be able to make any progress. That's why we need to understand that in all these circumstances, in times like this, we depend upon God. In Hebrews chapter 11, Verse 36, Hebrews 11, 36. And others are trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. You know, in the city over here, sometimes a person can do something atrocious in a particular community. Take a person, for example, that is living at Yaba. In his local community there, he does something that has spread. And they say, that thing is very, very bad. Now, but that doesn't affect his child going to school. That doesn't affect his, uh, his going to the market. That doesn't affect the things that are done on a social level, because this is a city. But sometimes in a village setting, somebody has given his life to the Lord. After he gave his life to the Lord, he was married to two wives before. And then we taught him about restitution. He made restitution and he drove away the second wife. And the whole village knew about it. And the chief, and you know, the word of the chief is a word of authority. The chief is like your father in that village. And you never say no to your father. And so the father of the village calls this uh, you know, man and he says, I heard that you drove away uh, so and so. Who is the daughter of so and so? And who that person is uh, the son of so and so. And in this village, you know that uh, you know, they will tell him the history. The person established this place. The first house in that uh, corner, that was the first house in this village. The great grandfather of that woman was the person that came to establish this village. And you drove away the person like that. What's the matter? No, is it because there's no child? I heard that you have this. Or is it because of this? Well, uh, as the chief here, I command you, go and take back the woman. And the chief has never experienced he saying anything to anybody in the village. And the person will stand up and he will say no. 
And surprisingly, this man even came in because now he has accepted Jesus Christ as personal savior. When he came into the chief, he did not stretch himself on the ground. He just, you know, bent like this and said, good evening, Papa. That was strange. Then he sat down. The chief told him to go back and take uh, that second woman. And he had the audacity to say, no. If you do that in the city here, that doesn't, who bothers? If you do that in the village, he must do it because now he's Christian. But when he does that, when the chief rings the bell, or the forerunner of the chief makes, you know, the sound of the iron and the wood, and they gather together, and they, sell, they say that that person, nobody should give him land to farm. If he brings his sins to the market, nobody should buy it. If he goes to the market in that place, he cannot buy. Oh, you say, maybe those of you at Ikorodio, you say, that cannot happen. Because this is 1989. But those in real village, that can happen. Am I right? And that person, the chief can even go beyond and call the, second, the first wife that is there and say, we'll remove you from that man. That man, this village has nothing to do with that person. Now, when you practice Christianity in such an environment, you know the power of prayer. Because it is then that you'll be able to know that this is Christ and this is the power of God through prayer. But on the other hand, if you have the power of God, in the village too, the advantage is that when something like that happens, when there is a miracle that happens, it's going to also affect the whole village. Just like there is a negative, there is also the positive. Last year, 1988, I went to Benin to have uh, a miracle service. And they came from various places. In a particular village, we had 12 members. Because the village there, they have been resisting uh, the preaching of the gospel as well as deeper life. And eventually, there was a woman that came from that uh, village, from a particular, that day were 12 members to the meeting. And the hands were paralyzed, the legs were paralyzed. She was walking like an animal on the ground. At the end of the miracle service, they were told that the miracle is on the way. Uh, now that they have been prayed for, even if they didn't see any change, let them go. As they are dropping their villages, their miracle will drop with them. And this woman got into the vehicle, was still crawling like an animal. They lifted her there. When she got down at the village, now, what happened is that the moment she got down, she became completely well. The legs were all right, the hands were all right, and she began to walk. Now, the thing is that the whole village came together all through that night. They were dancing. The following day, they were dancing. The following night, they were dancing. Until somebody said, now we must uh, get ready and go to the farm. But there was a public holiday night morning and night again and then the church grew immediately that from 12 they went to beyond 60 within about one week now because now they have seen the power of god many years ago i was um, in bendel sage i just traveled there because i often did that at that time and that time we preached all about and we got to this particular village the boy was lame and then the the mother was dancing around a particular pot that was upside down and there were things underneath that pot because of the power of god and the authority of the blood of jesus i wasn't afraid of that so we sat down and uh, the sister that took us to that village said we should pray for the boy so i said no now, in the village, you must time your prayer. You must do everything you do in the wisdom of God. So, I said, no, let the mother finish worshipping the idol. We are not in a hurry. We'll wait for her. So, we sat down. We didn't touch the boy. We didn't pray for the boy. We didn't even witness. We didn't talk about accept Christ or not accept Christ. I just sat down, meditating on the promises of God and on power in prayer. The other sister too, Sister Beatrice, also, you know, sat down like that. And other people that we had, they just sat down. 
So the woman ran around and did everything she wanted to do, half naked with, you know, wrapper just to the chest. But we just sat down there. When the woman finished, we greeted her, and I spoke, I said, look at your child. Look at what your God you are serving. Look at what he has done to your child. But we come with the living God. And that if you will destroy that thing, I'll pray for this child, and the child will get up. But that on one condition, that you will abandon your idolatry. Oh, she said, if God will do it, she will do that. But she's not going to abandon the idol first. Because if she abandoned the idol, and the child is still like that, then she has lost on both sides. I said, that's reasonable. So I said, but how about if this happens, what will you do to the idol? Oh, she said, what should, what should I be worshipping idol for? And so I prayed for that child. And, uh, you know, that time, it was raw faith. It's not like, you know, encouraging the child to get up or all that. You just pray for a child. You pull the child up those days. You didn't wait for, you know, whether the person will be hurt or whether the person will feel pain. I was much younger. I didn't know about anybody feeling pain at that time. So, just lifted up the boy, and the boy started walking, 1974. And the mother immediately just took that thing and threw it in the bush. <laughs> we led her, and she gave her life to the Lord. But we didn't go, because the father was not around. We waited. When we waited, then the father came back uh, from the farm. And then saw the boy walking. And I then started talking to the father. I said, now look at your boy. Your mother, your wife, has left the idol worshipping. The child has been led in the prayer of confession in their language. I'll pray in English. They interpreted to the language for the boy and also for the woman. And now everything is okay. Are you going to be the black leg? I told that time I was much younger. I didn't know about communication. I just said, are you going to be the black leg and the scapegoat worshipping idol alone? Oh, she said, if my wife and the child has left everything, I'm on the side of the Lord. We led, that to, we led him to the Lord. And he became born again. And we introduced them to a nearby church there. Now, that's village evangelism. Whereas, if it were in the town, we look at communication. We have in our message introduction, and then the first part of the message, another message, another type of message, then the conclusion, when we say, shall we rise up now? That's city. But we need to give them the raw power of God that will surprise them. And in those situations, we need to understand that praying is very important. And um, those days, of course, we ate what they provided. Because in all those places that we went, in those villages, in those days, a lot of uh, things they also provided, and we ate. The point I'm making is this. In times like this, in your own situation, the same God that worked in Bible days, that same God we need today. And if we trust him, I believe that your ministry this year will be totally different in Jesus' name. Amen. In Psalm 37, I'm reading from verse 5. Trust, from verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Trust in the Lord. In the villages you have come from, in the localities that you have come from, it may appear that retrenchment, unemployment, Sickness, confusion, barrenness, battle with idol worshippers, persecution, fears, or whatever, are the order of the day. Let us remember that in times like this, we need God. And you need to trust in the Lord and do good. Do the will of God while you are in the village. Because you have a lot of challenges. And those challenges can only be met by the power of prayer. And so trust in the Lord. It says, verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. We need to understand that in the communities where you are ministering, you need more of the power of God than you ever had before. I remember when I was um, growing up, I grew up in the village. And in the village, there were a lot, of, a lot of things that I can recollect now 
and understand if anybody were to get to that village and preach the gospel it will really be with the power of the almighty god i remember many many days we'll be asleep at night and you know we'll wake up the thing that will wake us up will be something running at the ceiling of the building my father will wake up mother will wake up all of us children will wake up and then the Ijebu man that had that was the landlord also having some other apartment my father will go and knock on his door and then he'll wake him up and say look at all this noise we cannot sleep what is happening and this man that at the house he will climb uh, at the ladder and then at the um, you know just seeing like this but there's a hold where you can get through and then he will be uh, speaking it still in the Jebu language that we can understand and then also he'll be calling his forefathers and all that and he'll be appeasing you know that thing and the thing will still be running up down up down nobody will, a great noise and eventually after talking and appeasing that uh, idol like that and everything everything will calm down and throughout the night we'll be able to sleep again and then during the day they'll make some sacrifices for some months uh, until the rainy season everybody will be at peace when rainy season comes again that thing can start all over and developing a village like that i knew that if somebody came to the village at that time and he will you know just come with no power with no prayer with no fasting with no authority he'll not be able to win anybody to the lord and during the time of the masquerades oh it was another thing there were some times that in the festivals that were going on the women were not allowed to come out and if they dare eat if some people who are strangers who are not of that community will say what are they doing that we cannot see what is hidden behind the curtain that nobody can see if he came if she came out and they pronounced anything these are unbelievers if they pronounced anything that was it if they said before seven days this will happen that's the thing that will happen you know uh, at uh, in the jebode uh, some time ago or uh, i was going to a particular church and these people they had become christians and so they were coming out they were going to church on sunday morning and that time it was the festival was going on they shouldn't normally ordinarily they shouldn't have come out and uh, when they came out people told them hey hey you know that this they mentioned the um the idol and the festival that they are coming these people because they are gospelers they just uh, you know went on their way and they kept on they went to the church and the people met them and they stopped them and they said uh, don't you know that women ought not to be outside now they said they were going to church and then they said what they wanted to say that is these idol worshippers they cursed them and uh, other people in the town at Jebode were going to them saying ah, you better go and see their head so that you can make sacrifice those who are saying no because we are children of God and they prayed and they pleaded the blood of Jesus Christ at the end of seven days nothing happened to them <laughs> it brought some people to the church because they knew because this is the that idol had history of years not just of a few years because it's something that everybody knew that's why i've been telling you that in the village and in the communities where you are if you can pray no problem if you cannot pray what are you doing in the village if you cannot pray you don't know the power in the blood of jesus christ you don't know the authority in the name of jesus christ you cannot solve problems and confuse all the demons of idolatry by the power of prayer what are you doing in the village and we need to understand that in times like this trust in god have confidence in god but you see there is nothing to be afraid of when you are in the village if you can pray if you can call upon god and i believe that even in the village the power of god will so work that the people they will bow down to the majesty and to the power of god in your life in jesus name Amen. but let us understand that what has made a village work to fail many times is that we are living and preaching and doing things as if you were in the city that is why many times i have corrected our pastors that are preaching in english in the suburb that what i would have liked to see is that you preach in the yoruba language 
And sometimes the excuse I have is that all these other people, factory workers are there, all these other people are there, they don't understand Yoruba. It's English they understand. You can really not help those villages and towns as long as you continue in the English language. What should have been done is that you preach in the local language of the people. And as you preach in the local language of the people in Yoruba or Egun or in any other local language, then the interpretation is done into English. And simultaneously, the person will stand um, with the preacher. Not that it will be done like, uh, you know, the English is over there, uh, like the interpreter is over there now. That is the thing that will make the village work to actually succeed. And until we learn all these things and we take the challenges of the village work, it will take us a very long time before we actually penetrate and before we actually sail through. We must know how to deal with demonic power. I remember in the home where we were, uh, when I was very, very young, even though I was just the age of eight to ten, but I remember very clearly because those things were too clear that you can never forget them. This woman in our, in our house, she was pregnant, but not of the same family. Uh, she was uh, an Ijebo woman uh, living in that same house. And uh, when she was pregnant, they said that this little girl, uh, the child of that same mother, didn't want the other one in the belly to be born. She didn't want a um, junior brother or junior sister. And so in the night, there will be terrible struggling that the woman will say that the pregnancy was being disturbed by this girl. And also there will be something that will be beating the girl and in the night, not that the mother will beat the girl, but during the day you will see marks of waves on the body of that child. You will see marks of waves on the body of the mother. And it was like the child was fighting against the mother because of the baby to be born. And the mother was, the baby inside was fighting against the one alive because, you know, they were struggling together. They hated one another. It was a terrible time. And in the morning, they will call us together. And during the holidays, when I didn't go to school, they will call us together and show us the body of that child and the body of that woman. The mass will be very clearly seen there. This is not uh, something I saw with my own eyes. And it's not something that happened only one day, only one week, only one month. It happened throughout the time of the pregnancy. In fact, sometimes before the woman will deliver to appease that girl and beg that girl, what do you want? What do you want your mother to buy for you? And generally the girl will say, I want chicken. I want this. I want this. And then we'll call all the other children in the village and they will kill the chicken. And then after doing that to all, that, uh, all those people, then the woman will be able to deliver. Now, if you don't know village life, you are preaching in the village. Somebody says he comes to church, and this is a problem they have. What do you do? And just say, no, it's fantasy. It's um, superstition. Nothing happens like that. How do you deal with that problem? The herbalists in town, how do you deal with them? The fortune tellers, how do you deal with them? The palm readers, how do you deal with them? That means if you are going to do village work, you should know your Bible. Know the power of God. And know that in times like this, you need God. Are you following what we're saying tonight? And so we must really make sure that we are people who can pray. In your own personal problems, you must be able to pray. In the problems of the people, you must be able to pray. Let's look at Psalm 56. From verse 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. We need that every time. What time I'm afraid? What time I have a problem? I will trust in thee. And if you trust in him, you will call upon him. In God I will praise his word. In God I will put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. That will take a man of prayer, a woman of prayer, a person that can stand in the word of God. It says, I will not fear what flesh can can do unto me but that's not the language of a person that just has natural boldness there are people that just have natural boldness but that cannot work every time in the village you must trust in god and you must be people of prayer and if um, at this workers retreat you'll come into a new realm of praying a new level of praying 
and you will just understand before you go back to your various locations you should have greater power of the lord greater praying ability and you should be able to solve the problems that you have with the power of prayer there is power in prayer do you believe that and prayer changes things and changes people and then in verse 8 that tell us my wanderings put thou my tears into thy bottle are they not in thy book let's remember again that david lived in his circumstance or in circumstances where there are a lot of troubles now it is not very likely that if you do not go to the zoo that you will see a lion or you'll see a bear but you know the situation of david he said when he was in the wilderness and was taking care of the sheep a lion came he fought against it a bear came another time he fought against it that will show you his own surrounding and the surrounding of a person working in a village setting is a surrounding that is very very bad i was talking about a demonic power and demonic oppression you know over here in lagos we have somebody that comes even to the bagada church but she lives in the outskirts of lagos but still within lagos environs not only that she is from a particular village and in that village is predominantly muslim not only muslim it's animistic to be animistic means worshiping all these things a spirit in this animal that animal that animal and do you know that in lagos here she had a farm at the back of her house and they have been worrying them that that's the husband and the wife they should come back to islam and they said no and this time she went to the farm at the back of uh, the um, yard where they were where they are living while cultivating the farm he had some real demonic manifestation that even the people in the surrounding they knew that something was good it was very very terrifying but because of the faith in her all that she has been hearing at Bagada on Thursday she just said in the name of Jesus and this is an illiterate woman and she knew that these were the people that sent those things to her and she took authority for the name of Jesus or the blood of Jesus Christ when that thing did not harm her it affected them in the village because when they sent that thing to her if it harmed her that will be okay for them if the thing could not harm her because that thing has been sent on assignment it must go back to the people that sent it and because it did something to them over there they came to Lagos the very next day and then to come and really use force on them that if that evil spirit did not harm them and came to harm the people that sent it now they were going to use force now if that can happen in the surrounding in lagos here how much more in the village that's what i'm telling you that we need the power of god do you know there are people that in their prayers they have never wept i'm not talking of shedding crocodile tears I'm not talking of something you make up. I'm, th I'm talking about real praying, agonizing in prayer, real deep heart praying. And if you are in the suburb, in the village, and all the prayer you pray is in Jesus' name, amen. No sweat, no agony, no fervency, no real praying. And you pray like an educated person that just bowed the head like this, like, you know, those Anglicans that say they are praying. And they say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Amen. In the village you are praying like that, you'll never win any soul. But the people that can pray. Don't you know how Jesus prayed? He prayed with sweats of blood. In real agony. And here David said, My tears are in your bottle. Talking to God. Oh, he said, you'll not... You cannot neglect those tears that came out out of the agony of my heart because of my circumstance, because of my situation. How can, you know, people who are in the, the village setting, no night vigil, no prayer and fasting, no agonizing prayer, no fervency in prayer, no authority in prayer. How shall we do the work? That's why we are saying that these people are difficult. The villagers, they will not yield themselves. They will not give themselves and they will not be born again and then we even preach and preach and preach they don't understand the salvation message 
when you really question the people in the various locations and you ask them what it means to be born again many of the people that have been coming for one year two years they don't understand salvation one because you are preaching in english and the interpretation in the language cannot really get through every get through to them everything that you are preaching two because your prayer does not drive in the preaching because your tears does not wet the message that you are giving unto them therefore everything is left high and dry i remember 1974 we went to uh, emirate and now this is uh, ekiti side and what we are doing there is that we wanted to establish the work of god there or a deeper life but then this other group they wanted me to go and help them so that we can have a crusade and then we can establish a church there and then we'll hand it over to another church after they had developed because that time deeper life was just having bible study and evangelism teams and i knew that to go and do something like that in a village will demand greater sacrifice and greater praying i didn't accept in time but that sister because she was concerned for her village kept on pestering me saying let us go let us go because these people are perishing and eventually we got there and the forces of darkness oh it was very high not only that the forces of darkness were very high the jehovah's witnesses they were raw jehovah's witnesses they knew their yoruba bible very well and all the quotations they would go to confuse people they knew everything and then the dark parts were on one side the jehovah's witnesses were on the other side and when as we went out all, and then the catholic church was entrenched in that place muslims on one hand jehovah's witness on the other hand the uh, catholic people also very very strong and then the anglicans who all that they knew is uh, baba Tim Belion. that's all they knew any other thing they didn't know any other thing and then we got there now what were we going to do now in the evening they all came out and I, because I, I knew that it will really take something very strong, I didn't accept to preach. I told another brother uh, that he should preach. And then he gave the message. But all the labor and everything, there wasn't much fruit. But eventually, we got them together on Sunday morning. And um, I knew more Yoruba at that time than I know now. Because that time I used to read Yoruba Bible a lot. And I preached um, in Yoruba to them. And then we'll go out one by uh, one by one knocking on their doors and we met those jehovah's witnesses and you know in the village they are not conscious of time that jehovah's witness can be with you for three hours he won't allow you to go and you if uh, you want even him to go he won't go and therefore you are there and you talk and talk and talk but you know to the glory of god a lot of things happened in fact when the other teams went out and they were having a bottleneck they'll come and call me where i was uh, witnessing or ministering and i will go there and sometimes i have a bottleneck too but whenever i get into a difficult situation and i'm talking to the person and i'm not able to penetrate i'll stop the preaching i'll tell the person let us pray because i know i can get him in prayer if i cannot get him in preaching and i'll just begin to pray and I'll pray, 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 and pray until he is melted down. After he is melted down, I will stop the prayer. I will start talking to him and lead him to the Lord. Then we come across some other people. We came across some other people at that time. That they understand what you are saying. They know you are saying they should accept Jesus as their personal savior. They should accept the teaching of the Bible. Then you tell them to pray. Immediately they close their eyes like this. They will be seeing figures that will be disturbing them. It may be just head alone, body alone, and all things. So they will open their eyes, they will say they cannot pray. They will say, this is what they are seeing. Immediately I will tell them, all right, if that is what you are seeing, because I know what is happening, then I pray and break that thing. Then I don't ask the people, those days, 1974, 75, I won't ask them, can you pray now? Because I know what I've done. I will say, now you can pray, now pray. And the person will begin to pray. Now that's how to do village work. But to do village work as if everything is easy and we do not, we feel that, you know, village is not a difficult. Satan has a seat in the village. 
He only comes, uh, you know, to the city to come and see that the people are still orderly. They are doing what he wants them to do. They go to nightclub. They go to dance. They go to do all that. But the real uh, throne and the siege, he has it back where there is enough darkness. Because he doesn't like the light. There's too much civilization and light in the city. Where darkness is, that is where he lives like a king unmolested, unchallenged. And if you are going to do something in that place, you must know your God. And that's why we came together this weekend. And um, that's why I felt that we shouldn't join you with the other people. So that we'll get you together and talk to you directly like I'm talking to you now. And uh, if you take all these challenges, I believe when you go back to your locations where you have come from, I believe that your victory will be a New Year victory. Amen. And I believe that you'll be able to do the work of God successfully in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And so, let this workers' retreat be a time of prayer, a time of challenges, a time when you'll be able to stand and say, Thank God now I can go back to the village. You know, 1974-75, when we went to all these places in, um, in um, Bendel State and Ondo State, and most of the time the villages and rural areas. In fact, you know, if I didn't get people that were sick or having demonic problem or something in a day, I'll be looking for them. I got to such a state at that time. These were the early years of uh, the ministry. I just teach Monday Bible study here, and at the weekend, we're in one village or the other. At that time, if I didn't get somebody demon-possessed, or somebody sick, or somebody having a particular problem, I'll be bothered. Because you do a lot of praying and fasting at that time that uh, you want to release the power somewhere. And you are looking for the people on whom you release that power on. That's why we always went to the village. Because just then in Lagos here, we just treat Bible studies, someone on the Mount, Ephesians, uh, Galatians, and Romans, and all that. But the time you had, actually had the release was when you went to the village. Now in the village, you ask somebody to pray for. Somebody who didn't understand anything at all. Somebody who cannot read the Bible at all. And the naked power of God, like naked electricity, will come as a shock to that person. And then when we go in a weekend like that, we came back uh, on Sunday night, then we have Monday Bible study, and all during the week I go for lectures at the university. That time is time of relaxation and getting ready again. I could not wait for another Friday to go to the village again. And when the power of God is in your life like that, you'll not be able to wait. In fact, you'll like the village. As I'm even talking now, I'm getting to like the village myself. <laughs> Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. And let us tell the Lord that this weekend, by the grace of God, will come into spiritual power. In times like this, remember God. Amen. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you very much this evening. We are grateful to you because you have brought us here to fill our empty vessels. We are grateful to you for what you have already exposed us to. That we are just in the Bible times. In the past, Lord, we have been thinking that there is no way. That we have been doing things that are just impossible. In fact, many of us are getting tired. Many of us, we are already discouraged. Many of us, we are carried away with problems and circumstances around us. But our God, we thank you. Because... We have heard your word. We have seen where we are. We have seen the weapons with which we can fight. We have, we have seen that in all the circumstances around us, God is around. Our God is near us. We pray that, Lord God, you accept our praises in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you very much because you have brought us here to shake away all our weaknesses, to shake away all our prayerlessness, to shake away all defeats and failures of the past, and to bring us into a realm of victory and success. Our God and our Father, I am praying that all that you have had today, God, will gear us up, will transform our lives, 
and we make us overcomers in our respective villages and towns in Jesus' name. Our God and our Father, I am praying, O oh God, that from today, you are going to baptize every one of us with the spirit of prayer in Jesus' name. We know that as workers in the village, we must have a prayer heart. We must have a believing heart. We must know our God as God. And we must know that God is near. Lord, we are praying that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that a total transformation will come upon every one of us from tonight in Jesus' name. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. Same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in 